courage, Lord, at this time, Lord. As many, have, many people have mentioned, it's only been about seven, now nine days into this new year, and so many unfathomable events have occurred, Lord. But nevertheless, Lord, you have told us to be strong and of a good courage, mm -hmm. to go forward knowing that your will is what will triumph, Lord. And we go forward, Lord, not uh, with swords and with spears, but with faith in your promises, Lord, with mm -hmm. words of encouragement and, and messages of mercy, of truth and of mercy, Lord, to this world, Lord. We pray that you will be with us in this worship, be with um, Dr. Jackson as he speaks, Lord. I pray that you will guide him, speak through him, Lord, that we may be fitted um, not simply just to endure what may come ahead, Lord, but we desire to shine as lights, oh, as yes, beacons Lord. of hope Amen. in this world, Lord, a light that contrasts the darkness so completely that even those in darkness will have to say, there is light with those group of people. Mm -hmm. This is what we pray for, Lord. May your Holy Spirit um, change our hearts, take anger and malice and, and, and retaliation, take these traits out of us, Lord, Please, Lord. and put mercy and gentleness mm. and patience, your spirit, Lord, yes, in Lord. us. This is our prayer, Lord. Yes, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. In Jesus' Amen. name. Amen. Amen. Can we take our Bibles and turn to the book of Revelation? Book of Revelation, chapter 14. <clears throat> Revelation, chapter 14, verse 1. And I'd like for us to read that text together. Revelation, chapter 14, verse 12, rather. I'm sorry. When you're there, just say amen, okay? Let's read it together. Verse 12, what does it say? Here is the patience of the saints. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith of Jesus. Notice that the faith of Jesus, not the faith in Jesus, two different things. And so we're going to look at Job's experience in the great controversy. And I have to do this in two parts in order to stay within the context of time. And uh, those not going to be back this afternoon, I have handout for the notes. Job experience in the great controversy. There are some things we'll go over that we heard before as we laid this foundation. Now, how many for me were Job? Job. I'm quite sure you can tell stories about Job. We know, you know, what do people usually call the book of Job? What do they say the book of Job is all about? Hmm? Anybody? Real quickly. Well, that is not a common thing, though, Jonathan. People don't say Job's reflection. It talks about Job's trouble and, and, and book of comfort. You know what I'm saying? Yes. We always refer to the patience. Of the patience of Job. Those type of things, which are all the good. But what you said, Jonathan, is something that we want to see. Definitely, Job's experience is the experience of those of us in the last days. Those who remain faithful like Job's would be the one that would stand on the sea of glass. Job's experience. But you don't hear too many people talk about that. You talk about the patience of Job, the comfort of Job, his miserable comfort, his miserable counselors, his four friends that came to give him advice. But their advice was from their own perspective. The wife that did not understand, probably did not know God when she told him, why don't you just curse God? And forsaken him. Job. Job has some practical lesson for us. Encouraging words. Job is our experience. So we'll lay the foundation here. We'll go to the screen and see here. We just read that text. And as you've seen this before, God has placed eternity in the heart of man. God has placed within man DNA to worship the creator. To give him glory. It's in the DNA. You cannot take worship out of a human being. It's there. They're going to worship something. <laughs> you understand what I'm saying? If you travel around the world, they're going to worship something. Trees, birds, man, rocks, what have you. So as he think in his heart, we have seen lesson after lesson that the thought process that we have would determine our action. Develop habits and character would determine our destiny. 
It's always at the thought level, the heart level. And Job gives us an insight to the heart of God. Do you hear what I just said? Job gives us insight into the heart of God. So therefore, anybody remember the three Ds? All right, let me put you to the test. What's the first D? All right, I see you hesitate. What's the second D? What's the second D? Direction. What's the third D? Decision. Y'all didn't sound with confidence now. See, one thing why people say, why you go over and over? Because repetition deepens the impression on the mind. You know, you throw something up in one time, one month, then you don't remember anything. But I, I try to overlap to keep reinforcing the destination, direction, and decision. Life in three Ds. It's a template. Not just uh, as I sat him back there talking to a young man and came up with some very concrete things. Life in three Ds. What's your destination? What's your direction? What steps are we going to take? You can apply that to your business. You can apply that to your personal life. You can apply it to your family life. You apply it to ministry. If you and I do not have a definitive goal, we set ourselves up for falls. We must have a goal. Hmm? Three Ds. Life in three Ds. Let's go back here real quick here. So the destination, the goal, the end result, very clear. We find destination. Our destination is what? By the what? The rescue we take. Keep that in mind. Now what is meant by that statement? Our destination is reached by the direction we take. Now, I can't no move no further unless you really get this. Once you set a goal, that goal trickle on down and dictate to you and I what, sorry, what steps or what method we choose to accomplish that goal. You get what I'm saying? Like I asked a person last week, I said, what are the criteria that you use to make your decisions? Does anybody understand what I just said? What are the criteria? What are the standards by which you choose to do what you do? You get that? And I said, well, you know how we, we hunch our shoulder? I said, oh, that's the criteria, hunch your shoulder, huh? How many times you got to hunch your shoulder to get to where you're going? Come on, talk to me now. God's given us intelligence. There are criteria. There are standards by which I choose to do certain things. So once I set a goal, then I got to determine what are the criteria that I use to cause me to start on that pathway. Hmm? When we think about direction, that's the path, the method. You can put, apply it to the ministry, every department. What's the destination of the department? What's the destination? What's the path? What's the method I'm going to use to accomplish that destination? Then it goes on down to decisions. Our, let's read this together. What does it say? Our what? De destination is reached by the direction we take based on the decision we make. That means that once I establish a definitive goal, that will help me to determine my choices. Did you get that? Your goal dictate your choices. If you don't have a goal, you're going to say, well, it feels good, it looks good, tastes good, smells good. That's not security. Decision, the choice, the will. The will. Very important. What's Philippians 3.13 say? And 4, 14. What does it say? Say, I forget those things in the past. I press forward. Then verse 14 say, I press towards the mark of God, the high calling in Christ Jesus. That's what it says. So it says here, again, repetition. Higher than the highest human thought can reach is God's idea for his children. What is that idea? Godliness, God likeness. Keep this in mind. I, I shared last night as we have in devotion. I am 
come to the conclusion that we as a people have not grasped this thought that God idea for you and I is God likeness. I cannot overemphasize that. When we are interacting with people in business, ministry, I don't care where it go, as a Christian, we must be governed by the thought that God wants us to be God-like. Did you hear what I'm saying? In every situation, he gives us opportunity for that to be revealed in my character. It stuff out my idea. God likeness is the goal to be reached. What is that like? What does that like? That means if you and I are in any kind of contention or conflict, then me as the Christian, as a person, how do I respond to your action? How do I respond to it? If that's my goal, God likeness. So therefore, I must allow God to reveal himself through me to you that you might be one to him. So my attitude in that situation cannot be one for tit for tat. It cannot be combative. It cannot be for resistant, resistant. Then God likeness, I got to think of the mind of Christ. We say it over and over. Humility is power under control. That means when you insulted me, when I know I can put you in your place, I sit there until God tells me to do something. That's God likeness. I see you. That means you sit there being insulted until you hear that voice from God say, be quick to listen, slow to speak. Wow, that's going on, son. This is what I want you to do. Did you get that? If you are not making that daily connection with God, day by day, moment by moment, you would not hear the voice of God. You cannot hear the voice of God because prayer is us communing with God. Word is God communing with us. So if you and I do not have a love affair with God's word. You can be in that situation and you'll be trying to muster up some human strength to resist it as much as you can, but there's no power. Did you get what I'm saying? There's no way you and I are going to reveal this if we do not have a personal, intimate acquaintance with God's word. It says, acquaint yourself now with God. And you can tell the tenant of your heart in these situations when your reaction is out of harmony with the will of God, that tells you something about your devotional life. Did you get what I just said? How you respond? Listen to this statement. I said it before over and over. My joy, my peace, my happiness is connected, Jonathan, to other people's behavior. Tell me what I'm talking about, Jonathan. Did you hear what I just said? All right, that's all right. No, it's all right. Don't no, get right. Did anybody understand what I just said? No. All right. That your joy, your peace, your happiness is connected to other people's behavior. That means that whatever that person do, how they act, respond, will determine whether you're going to be happy or not. Did you get what I just said? You ain't getting this. You ain't getting it. That is all of our lives until we become disconnected with that behavior to Christ Jesus. Woo. <laughs> you ain't getting this. Understand that? Hmm? That means my happiness, my joy, my peace is connected to that woman behavior called my wife. So when she messed up, I messed up. I get depressed. I get angry. I get upset. I develop an uh, unforgiving spirit. That's, what I'm, that's putting some flesh on it, God. So whatever behavior is, if I'm in Christ, that behavior does not affect my love. I hope, is that clear? Does that got flesh on it enough? <laughs> Thank you, Rose. A lot of flesh. Come on now. I just want to. Yes. 
it's not much of a comment, but the chapter from Ministry of Healing that says that's in contact with others Come on now. sums up exactly what Amen. you said. It's real intense. Amen. God is really calling us to a high standard. And that is something that does not come overnight. And that's something that I thank God for 2020 and 2021. I stumbled my wife last night. I praise God for that. That to learn to allow my existence to be dictated through an intimate relationship with God when I'm encounter with human relationship, the behavior of the other person does not alter that spirit of mine. That does not come overnight, folk. But we need to be cognitive of that. That's what we want. Godliness, righteousness, is holiness, likeness to God. You got to get it in our minds that we are placed on this earth to reflect the character of God. Look at the darkness that's covering the world. It goes on and says, it is conformity to the law of God. For all thy commandments are righteousness. And love is the fulfilling of the law. Righteousness is love. And that love is not sick, sentimental love. That love has power in it. That love changed. That love changed the, uh, the course of history. <laughs> How did I know that? Calvary. Calvary was an exemplification of the love of God. It changed the course of world history. And that's why you and I are sitting here today. Because of that love. Power. Huh? Love is the light and the life of God. And we ought to reflect that light. These texts tells me Christ in you and I. What we want is Christ to come into our life. This is forever. Christ to come into your life, my life, to live out his life of obedience. You get that? That Christ come into my life, live out his obedience through me. Not my obedience. I hope you get that. This is a wonderful experience when all I need to know is, is to say, look, I, Lord, I open up the door of my heart. Now, I need to maintain that connection. Now, Christ come in, live out his obedience. He live out his faith through me. He live out his victorious life through me. Now, if that's error, those who listen, those who are here, let me know because it's not error. The vine and the branch tell me that, sir. If I'm abiding in Christ, that sap that comes from his life, which the Holy Ghost, empower me to live a life like Christ. Hello out there. That doesn't mean it's going to be instantaneous, but I'm going to live that life. I, gonna, I am going to live the life. Every morning I get up, I got to say I'm getting a step closer. And now, God going to allow conflict. <laughs> He's going to allow suffering. He's going to allow disappointment. He must do that, folks. Get that settled in your mind, but be conscious when the disappointment, the conflict come, that God has placed you in the arena now to let him display his character. So you're not caught up into yourself trying to defend and trying to cover yourself. You say, Lord, just give me grace for this moment. I hope I'm making sense to just one person. I hope so. One person. The righteousness of God, over and over, is embodied in Christ. We receive righteousness by receiving him. All I need to do is receive him. And Christ, the Bible tells me, in the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And so therefore, right here, if you and I are not spending time here on our knees in the morning in this word, we're going to go through that day. Defeated. Defeated. We got to. And faith come by what? Hearing. And hearing the word. So since faith come by hearing the word, which got when we get to Job, and I said in time past when I said, faith is trusting God. You say that again. Faith is trusting God meaning that you have complete confidence and dependence upon a sovereign God who can deliver us. We saw this in prayer, who can give us in, in our staff meeting some of us. 
He is our strength. He is our deliverance. So if I do not have any acquaintance with the word, I can't build no faith. Come on, talk to me. If this book is closed, you only open up when you got trouble. Huh? You can quote a strip or two, but if you're not feeding the word, because this word here is the very mind of God. This is the mind of God. That's why you don't put it on the floor. You don't put stuff on it. It's the mind of God. You don't toss it around. It's the mind of God. Just practical input. Because we are now, as someone said, nine days in 2021, it's already exciting. We got 360, what? No, we got 357 more days. <laughs> more days. We know the story. Christ is just looking for a reflection of himself. You know, it might not sound, it might sound strange, but I cannot fathom that, that the capital was, un, was under siege. I, we got folks been in the military. He has got a brother here, brother Watson. Who else been in the military? Anybody been in the military? Military, military, come on now. You, you're talking about the capital. Huh? You, you're talking about a place of security. And the poor common people just, just, they was oblivious to the consequences. What could have taken place? That gives indication, man, we live in this under some demonic influences. It's not human influence. It's not human. Revelation 14 talks about that great controversy. Well, that was a war in heaven. You know the story. Michael and his angel fought. The old accuser of the, the accuser of the brethren started accusing. The accuser is the abuser. Amen. Keep that in mind. You bring this to some practical things. You found, you see that in Revelation 12, 17, 13. Accuse God day and night. The accuser. Until the accuser was cast out. Hmm? And all of his partners were cast out with him. Then we see the great controversy. You just jot these down. Isaiah 14, 12 and 17 talks about this covering cherubim. Describe who he was, a created being next to Christ, huh? Until he conversed with his own heart, pride. P R I D E. Proverbs 14 said, All contention, pride is the only source of contention. Pride. Did you get that? You read it. So if there's contention among brothers and sisters in the church and the ministry, then there's only one solution. It's not my way. It's that's one. Somebody's very powerful. But if two people are still bumping heads, they both proud folks. So somebody got to lay down. What was that verse? I think it's Proverbs 14. No, it's in the book of Proverbs. Only by pride, only by pride comes contention. Let's see. Can I find it very quickly? Time slip away. Only by pride. I know, I think it's in 14. Now, when you read words like that, you know, you don't have to search for a cause. It's already there. No, it's not. Let's see, the 14. Do, 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 do. No, it's in 14. All right. Is it 10? 14, Proverbs 14, 10, no, no. It says contention. Is it 13, 10? Okay. Somebody said. I'm sorry, 13, 10. Proverbs 13. Yeah, that's it. Thank you. I know it's for Thank you, sir. You see it, Jonathan says, it says, only by pride cometh contention, but with well advice is wisdom. So the Bible gives a solution, the cause of every one of our problems, and God wants us to be God-likeness. So the cues of the brother, pride. Isaiah 14, pride was lifted up. Ezekiel 28. Now, he said, I'm going to be like the Most High, right? Now, you know the devil don't want to be like Jesus. So what do you want to be like the Most High? 
He wants his power. He wants his power to control. He can't reflect the character of God, huh? Notice what it says in Christ's triumph. Herod and the wicked authorities killed the just one, but Christ never killed anyone. And we may attribute the spirit to its origin, Satan. He is a deceiver, a liar, a murderer, and accuser of the brethren. Listen to this. He loves to see human misery. That's his joy. He exudes over there. And know what we do? We add to that joy when we continue to bring misery to other people. Amen. He just sat back there and just watched him kill himself. And if you're in the midst of that, that devil got to be rebuked. He exudes on distress. He loves that stuff. What took place in Washington, it trickled down into our personal relationships. Huh? John 10.10, 10, he comes as a thief a destroyer, and a murderer. In, in John 8, 44, he is a liar, a murderer. That's, that's, his, that's his dossier. That's what old text tells us, huh? In Genesis 3, 15, the bruiser is the bruiser of the heel. He bruised the heel. So he's the bruiser in Genesis 3, 15. He's the one that bruised. He's the one that brings the pain. It says here, this conflict was open upon the Son of God. He was afflicted. Now, add this. When you read these statements, just not to read it to apply it general. Apply it to your life. This is what it says. We talk about Christ. This conflict was open upon the Son of God. He was afflicted. He was what? Sick. Now, when you and I receive Christ in our life, we're going to receive some affliction. Does that make sense? Yes, indeed. So why complain about it? The Lord give me grace. You work your life through me. Notice what it says. It says here, he was what? Despised. Anybody despised in here? If you're in Christ, all right, welcome. You don't focus on that despise. You focus on what God wanted to do with you in that situation to manifest his glory. Now, it might sound not comforting to you and I, but it's not about you. It's not about you, not about me. It's about God. It's about God. You got to get this out of your mind. And rejected. We've been rejected. A man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. You know, in order to help other folks to weather through the storms of life, according to God's will, you and I have to also have had some experiences that we can be able to to help them. Did you get to what I'm saying? God give us experience that someone down the line needs some comforting. But if we never experience that, how can we give something we never experienced? It goes on and says here, the majesty of heaven had to leave the scene of his labor again and again because of Satan's bruising his heel. And finally, Satan's malignity reached its utmost power when Satan inspired and control the minds of wicked men to crucify him. He has, notice, he has followed, Satan has followed the children of God, causing them disaster and death. Isaiah, Daniel, John have in prophecy announced these very struggles and conquests that God's people would pass through. And the triumph of Satan in his supposed victories is written for our admonition and our encouragement. Christ was the object of Satan's abuse. Hmm? Object. Christ suffered keenly under abuse and insult at the hands of the being whom he had created and for whom he was making an infinite sacrifice. He received every indignity and he suffered. No, notice this. He suffered in proportion to the perfection of his holiness. Did you all get, did you understand what, you, what we just read, Sheldon? He suffered in proportion to the what? To the perfection of his character. Now, time, let that settle there. To the perfection of his character. Now, Christ without no sin. 
holy. So his suffering was in proportion to the perfection of the character. That means his suffering we cannot even enter into. And we think of the suffering we're going through. It's only proportion to our character. <laughs> I know you all read this before. That's why I tell my father, I said, you got to read every man. It says that, and he suffered in proportion to the perfection of his holiness and his hatred of sin. He had a hatred of sin that was stronger than death. That's why we got to pray, Lord, give me a hatred for sin like Christ had. We do not hate sin like Christ hated. If we hate it, we will not hurt folk. We will respect them. We will treat them right. We will serve. We will try to rescue people. It says here that his trial by men who acted as what? Fiends. Was to him a perpetual sacrifice. What does perpetual mean? Continuous. Even if they're wrong. You see, and based on that, Carl, you're true. I know you're raising that, you know, for all of us to understand that human beings, because of 73 years, 20 years, we have been cultured into a certain mindset that when we hear something like that, wait a minute. That's not, that's not good. But we have not really become genuine acquainted with the character of God. When that takes place, this will become clear to me. Now, we haven't got to Job yet. We'll do that. Even when they're wrong, Carl, to be surrounded by human beings under the control of Satan. Satan was revolting to him. Now, remember, these are the, we are the creatures who he made, created with a purpose. And to be surrounded with those things who've been de de demonized, motivated by the spirit of demons. When it says it was revolting to him, it, that revolting does, did not generate a hatred toward the human being. It's the very disposition, the very act that was revolting. You know, have you ever had an experience where it make you puke? I don't know if you ever had that. Something revolting. You know what I'm saying? Anybody understand? Revolting. Huh? You know, it just, I mean, it does something to your very being. Then it goes on. It says, and he knew, he knew that in a moment, listen to this, he knew that in a moment by the flashing forth of his divine power, he could lay his cruel tormentors in the dust. What do we do? When we are being approached, insulted, attacked, what do we do? Yeah. Family, I'm taking my time. Because we got to get to a place where we realize that it's Christ who is the one under attack through you and me. Did you get that? We got to get to the place, Carl, that when I am face these situations, I got to keep it ever in the very front part of my mind. This is not about me. What they're doing, it's not about me. It's Christ. It is his honor, his integrity that is at stake here. And I'm saying we don't think that way. We are not ever conscious that when I'm thrust into a situation in the work field, the ministry, the church, I don't care where it is, I don't, I don't believe that the average one of us are cognizant of that. We just kind of fact that I can deliver a message and I can really tickle the minds of folk 
And soon I walk out, I'm approached by something insulting in my life. And even though my words might not come up, but there's something swelled up in me and said they got the audacity. We have many ways of manifesting the demonic spirit. <laughs> that old self is hard to die. God, it's hard to die. Because when he's dead, you kick him. Now, if you believe in spiritualism, he'll talk back to you. <laughs> <laughs> Let me go. Well, Calvary. Calvary. The spotless Son of God hung upon the cross, his flesh lacerated with stripes. Those hands so often reached out in blessing, nailed to the wooden bars. Those feet so tirelessly on ministering of love, spiked to the tree. That royal head pierced by the crown of thorns. Those quivering lips shaped to the cry of woe. And all that he endured, the blood drops that flow from his head, his hands, his feet, the agony that racked his frame, and the unutterable anguish that filled his soul at the hiding of his father's face. That's why that cloud came in. He experienced a separation. From a holy God with sin. He became my sin. That I don't have to taste that second death. Speaks to each child of humanity. Declaring it is for thee that the Son of, of God consents to bear this burden of guilt. For thee he spoils the domain of death. And opens the gates of paradise. He will steal the angry ways and walk the foam-capped billows. Who made devils tremble and disease flee. Who open blind eyes and call forth the dead to life. Offer himself upon the cross as a sacrifice. And this from love to you and me. You and me. Expression of infinite love. Satan determined to defeat God's plan. We need not, now listen to this, we need not try to understand the motives that prompt the being next to Christ in the heavenly courts to bring envy and jealousy in the ranks of the angels. To many, he communicated his disaffection. And there was war in heaven, which ended in the expulsion of Satan and his sympathizer, Christ triumph. page 19. We need not puzzle our minds for a reason for Satan act as he did. Could a reason be found that would be excuse for sin? Did you get that? You cannot explain this. It says, but there is no excuse for the killing, the bitterness, the unforgiving spirit, the resentment, the abuse. There is no reason human beings should travel over the same ground that Satan traveled. After Satan was thrust from heaven, he determined, no, no, he determined to set up his kingdom on this earth. That's where we are. Through him, through him, sin entered the world and death by sin. By listening to his mis, I like this, misrepresentation of God. I hope you get this. This is why our walk with Christ is so shaky. Because we have a misrepresentation of the character of God. Did you get that? Even in the pulpit, in the church, it's a misrepresentation because we're not giving it the right place in the word. It says here, by listening to his misrepresentation of God, Adam fell from his high estate and the floodgates of woe will open upon our world. The floodgates will open Upon our world. Satan, coming down to a point. Satan has challenged God's character and his right to rule the universe. Satan has said that God's, un said that God's unfitness 
to rule is proved by giving what? A law that could not be kept. That's St. John saying, look, you're making a law and not one of your children can keep that law. That's his charge. Huh? You unfit, God. Satan has had great success in advancing his claims in the great controversy. He was successful in persuading God's chosen people in the Old Testament to think that God is unfair and harsh. You know that. We've seen the history of that. In the great apostasy after the New Testament, Satan convinced Christians that God wants certain rituals and human works to supplement Christ's work at the cross. It appears from a human perspective that Satan is going to win this battle. And as we look at the world situation, we shake our head, but those of us who know clearly God is still on the throne. And it cannot go wrong because he has a mandate. Huh? So, this fear is addressed in Daniel 8, 13 by several questions. Number one, how long will this controversy go on? Number two, how long will God's good name be trodden underfoot? How long will the sanctuary be trampled? That's all in the book of Daniel 8, 13. How long? How long? And God has the answer for that. Will Satan win after all? No, these fear are addressed in Daniel 8, 13. The answer comes in verse 14. No, it will not go on forever. But God said after 2,300 days, a day for a year, after 2,300 years, see Ezekiel 4, 6, Numbers 14, 34, a day for a year principle, the sanctuary will be cleansed. There will be an end to the defaming of God's name. God will be vindicated. Romans 3, 4. We are people of the sanctuary while Christ is mediating. Standing between the living and dead, that will separate us from God is our sinful lives. And God wants us to cast it on him and purge us and cleanse us. That we said, Lord, come in, empty me of myself. The word justified in this context means acquitted of charges, declared innocent. That means you and I are God's witnesses. You and I are the one who has declared we found him not guilty. And how we declare that? Through a life that is a reflection of the life of Christ. Jesus did vindicate God's law and his character in the noblest demonstration ever seen on earth. John 17, 3 and 4. Jesus showed that God's law is good. His character is love. Romans 7, 12. John 4, 7 through 9. Jesus did that. Let's move on and see this as we close on. But one nagging question remained unanswered. Can sinful human beings who have spent half of their lives in rebellion really live out without rebelling anymore? Maybe Jesus could, but can they do it? Now, this is it. Jesus vindicated, but now, as we say in the sport world, the ball is in our court. We are the solution to the United States problem. We are the solution to China, England, Germany, Russia. We are the solution. You might not see yourself. The vindication of God and his government was not completed at the cross. God is waiting for a final vindication before the end of sin on this planet. All heaven is waiting to hear us vindicate God's law. And every day, every moment, God gives us opportunity. And the way he gives us those opportunities is through seemly disappointments, which are divine appointments. Through suffering, through trials, through letting you down, through not fulfilling your expectations. 
And when you understand God's character, those things that's happening to you take on a different perspective. You see, God is striving with you. That is the indication that God is with you. Did you know that? He's with you. In the darkness. He's with you. Revelation 14, 1 and 5. Describe the last generation who will live on this earth before Jesus comes. God has made an incredible promise here. He claims that he will produce a people who will be without deceit or fault of any kind. He will produce that people. It says here in the book of Desire Ages 671, the honor of God, the honor of Christ is involved in the perfection of his people. Did you get that? It is not our honor. I said that earlier. It's not our honor or salvation that is involved here, but God's name and his character. He has promised that he will perfect his people. Take that home with you. Can he really do it? If he cannot make us perfect, then his word is a lie. And Satan wins the great controversy. It's that simple. That simple. That simple. God will vindicate his law and deliver his people. It is important to note that God does the vindicating of his name, but it's also vital to understand that he would do the vindicating in the character of his people. Ezekiel 36, 20, 23, he said, I'm going to sanctify my name in you that has been profaned among the heathen that it might be sanctified. You read that, right? He does the vindication. Now, history here. We started with Adam, on down to Seth, to Noah, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, the children of Israel, the breaking of the covenant, division of the kingdom. Ten tribes went to the north. We find two tribes with the south, the Jews. Then come the restoration of Jews in the time of Christ. Then the desolation of the Jews when God pronounced the desolation. Then it went on to the apostolic church. Then the church went into the wilderness, came out. That's the Protestant Reformation. As a result of that came the seven-day Advent movement. And out of that movement going to come the final church, which we call the church triumphant. That's your history. That's your genealogy. You are living in a glorious time. I don't trace my church to 1900, to 1800. Trace it all the way back to the Garden of Eden. Are you with me, folk? You're in the right place at the right time. So just... Be quick like men and women say, Lord, bring it on. Give me grace that I can vindicate your name. This is a history. If you need the chart, I'll be glad to give it to you. Huh? Let's move on. The church triumphant. The church triumphant. If you're in this church, you're in the right place. But you're not safe. You're not safe just being in the church. You're only safe if you're in Christ. Many people join the church, but they never join Christ. And there's those who despise the movement and start their own movement. Those who are in the movement, we brag about the movement, but we don't know Christ in the movement. And those outside the movement don't know Christ either. Because if they knew the movement, they would not try to start another movement. Because I just showed you there's only one movement. Huh? Trace the history of your movement. Trace it. Anybody listen to me? Trace it. It could be any movement. 25, 20 movement. Free church movement. Advent, whatever, movement. All of movements everywhere. It's only one movement. And that movement, though as defective as it is, God is going to produce a people. And he's doing it now. I, in this movement, I want to declare every opportunity I get, Lord, take this human frail mind of mine, and whatever you need to do for it, with it, do it, so I can truly reflect your care. What about you? Hmm? There's those who are listening. Those who are listening. My appeal. And maybe those here. And you're not here just to hear a message. You're here because you want the strength and the hope. But I want to first say to you that make sure 
make your call election sure. If you're not part of Christ, if you're not here today, I don't want to close out and say we had a good time. It's a time to say, Lord, I hear your voice. I want to be in you. If I'm in you, I'm in the movement. But being in the movement, I'm going to be part of that company that will be your witness to this world. And those who have not made that, God said today, when you hear his voice, heart not your heart. Come, Lord Jesus, because he stands at the door. Amen? For the remnant people, be of good courage. For the remnant people, look at your trials. Look at your disappointment as God's instrument of making you like his son. Don't focus on that. Thank God for it. Let us live in the spirit of gratitude and thanksgiving. And may God keep us through these hours. And those who might not be with us, if you need uh, for the part two, just ask me. You can get them after the program. We're going to have a word of prayer. Close out, then we have a closing song. Let us kneel and pray. Gracious, eternal, holy, righteous Father. Lord, we thank you. Though these words are not new to our ears, but the force of them, Father, bring it to the very depth of our hearts that we would no longer be thinking our own thoughts, but you will set up your divine rulership in these hearts of ours, and you will live out your life of obedience through us, your life of faith through us. You will bring into our hearts all the divine attributes of the Father, the sovereign God of heaven. Cast out of these hearts of ours the spirit of contention, the spirit of doubt and fear. Cast everything out of these hearts, Father, that hinder you from manifesting yourself fully. So, Lord, our Savior, come, Lord Jesus. We give you consent to come into our lives and be to us a Savior, a Lord, and a King. Those who declare that they want to be part of your final church, give us grace and strength. Those who are still in the valley of decision, Lord, give them rest nor peace. Day or night, do they recognize their only hope is to allow you to come in and sup with them. Give us grace for the remaining part of this day. And let your holy angels be about us. Anoint our lips and words that all we discuss today will be for your edification, for the edification of our bodies and minds, and for your glorification. And we thank you for this. In the lovely name of Jesus, we pray for you. Amen. 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 Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ. I now live in the flesh I live by the faith of the Son of God.
Crucified